Uh, and by now, um, we've heard a lot about Mayor Condon. After all, he's the first mayor to be reelected to a second term in a, in a long time. Uh, but by now, we know the mayor's backstory. He was born the same year as Expo 74 in this community. We are aware of his service in the military, his service to our federal congresswoman, and of course, his beautiful family. Today, the mayor is focused on delivering results for our city through projects and initiatives defined in the city's Joint Administrative Council Strategic Plan and the combined efforts of 2,000 city employees, the mayor is going to tell us why he's so optimistic about Spokane's future. At this time, please join me in welcoming Mayor David Condon to the stage. city we do have that momentum moving forward I think there the Sun is bright for Spokane uh, Washington we have amazing partnerships going on and I think there's just more good things to come as we work together the needle seems to be going in the right direction now and I'd love to see that momentum continue into the future but what makes me optimistic about Spokane is I'm I'm a born native right here in this community, 59 years, I'm proud to say it. I seen it when Spokane wasn't too much of nothing going on. In the last five years, this Spokane is gonna be a city to be reckoned with. Every year you, we, they make you know, definite improvements to different areas of the city. I think it's, you know, it's a great place to live. I'm very optimistic to see nothing but really uh, good steadily increases for myself and the business. More people wanting to take these trips, more travelers, more tourists that are coming through this area. Where we have the people, we have the knowledge, we have the resources. I'm extremely optimistic about Spokane's emergence in the green economy. I moved here for the opportunities. This is the city of choice. Good afternoon and thank you for joining me for the annual City of Spokane State of the City Address. What an honor it's been for me to serve Spokane, my hometown, and helping it become the city of choice. This is the eighth and the final time I'll deliver this speech as your mayor. During these annual touch points, I've asked you to be Spokane, to embrace the notion of I am Spokane and even to sit in a blue chair and tell me what your Spokane looks like. But for me, this year isn't about looking back. Sure, I'm proud of the many accomplishments of our city organization and of our community. And we'll talk about some of those today. But mostly, I'm looking ahead, pushing forward important work and scanning the horizon for new ideas and new possibilities of what's ahead for this city that I love. My cabinet members tell me that it's time to slow the good idea train, but that's just not easy for me. As I talk to people around the community, I can't help but work on things that will strengthen their businesses, improve their neighborhoods, and to make their lives better. Things that make us safer, that make us smarter, that make us healthier. But I'm not the only one who is bullish about Spokane. Last fall, we held a community conversation with citizens who met us by phone, web, and social media. About 6,500 people joined us through all those different avenues. We talked about the budget and what was important to, the, to them and about the city. And we wanted to know what was important to them. We asked if they were optimistic about Spokane's future. Nearly 80% of the respondents told us that they were either very or somewhat optimistic. You know, optimism is an interesting concept. Really, it's a feeling of hopefulness and confidence in what lies ahead. It started my quest to explore what makes us optimistic about Spokane. Planning for the future health and growth was what the Spokane City Council and I set out to do when we created and developed the first ever Joint Administration Council Strategic Plan. We laid out a bold vision for our community that says, Spokane is a diverse, resilient, 
sustainable, and growing city known for its natural beauty, economic prosperity, and exceptional quality of life for all. That, step, that statement demonstrates our optimism. The printed materials that you have on your tables point to the progress towards many of those initiatives and strategic outcomes included in that plan. We've reorganized that information on our website too to make it easier for you to track our progress and to learn more. My talk today will highlight some of the progress on those initiatives and the programs outlined in the strategic plan. And we'll show you videos that demonstrate our optimism and what we're trying to achieve. My thanks to Dean Percy and the City Cable 5 team, to the web group, to our graphic designer, Matt Budke, and to the mayor's office staff and to the city's communications team for their help in making all these materials possible. Additionally, we're proud to say that we are already seeing some of the strategic outcomes of that council and I highlighted moving in the right direction. Meeting household income is up. Property values are increasing. We're seeing increased public safety indicators and more jobs created. And population is on the rise. Population, people, our people. That's where I get my inspiration and my optimism. We're on a roll and we're poised to have even more great things come to our city. During the past year, we've seen lots of new investments in our community. And I mean right down at the neighborhood level. We've invested $150,000 from a grant to help revitalize a small part of the East Central neighborhood. And there we find a new restaurant called Fresh Soul that opened its doors just past summer. Fresh Soul's specialty is delicious Southern food, but it also serves up employment opportunities and first time job training for Spokane's teens. Let's take a look. This is Ashley. How may I help you? Three ribs and large green. This is soul food. This is the real deal. Mm -hmm. We got uh, ribs, chicken, right. hot meat, pulled pork, pulled rib, and of course fried chicken. It also is a mentor program. First and foremost, we want to mentor these kids. Mr. Brown has always had an open door if you really want it and you come down and prove that you really want it, he'll give you a chance. All kids are looking for discipline. They really do want some discipline, and we're gonna make sure they get that here. I think it's good when you're ready for it. I mean, starting off young is perfect. I think you're less likely to get on bad paths, like drugs, alcohol, and all that. Plus, I have a job, and I can make some money, so that's kind of cool. What we're trying to teach these kids to be consistent in what you're doing. Order up! They're easy, but when they want things done, they want it done right and immediately. I need a rippy. Before I started this program, I was a super shy person. I didn't want to talk to nobody. And then, like the next few days, I would talk to everybody. I still do. I've learned quite a lot. So when I go to find another job, I can be reliable. We're gonna give these kids some skills to have when they're ready to go to the next level. This is not a Michael thing. This is not a Sarah thing. This is a God thing we're doing here. It's a community. We want people to get involved. Michael Brown is here with us today. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Michael and Fresh Soul are great examples of the community working with the city to achieve great results. Union plumbers and other workers pitched in. Lowe's donated materials and manpower. The transportation benefit district funds paid for new sidewalks and landscaping along Fifth Avenue. And coming soon to Fifth Avenue will be the new Carl Maxey Center, an expansion of the Head Start by the Community Colleges of Spokane, the new Chaz Dental Clinic, and programming by the MLK Family Outreach Center at the East Central Community Center, along with new, a new library in the nearby Liberty Park. This area will see a new focus on racial and social justice, economic and workforce development, education and advocacy, and cultural enrichment. These are the kinds of community investments that are making Spokane more optimistic and inclusive. Working together always leads to better outcomes. When I first came to the city, sometimes working across department lines was challenging, to say the least. Since then, we've embraced integrated approaches to our work to deliver greater value for our citizens. This year, we stretched our partnership and integration concept in a bold way 
Our strategic plan directs us to pursue metro collaboration, and we're doing that. Last month, the Public Facilities District, the City Government, and the Parks Board all approved an agreement to work together to build a new sportsplex on the North Bank. The facility will support national and regional sporting tournaments, as well as local sporting events. The facility will be part of the continuing renaissance of the North Bank, complementing the arena as well as new private investment in the Wonder Building and the renovation of the newly renamed Centennial Hotel. The Sportsplex is only one example of the Metro collaboration and will assist us in helping become a healthier city. In November, local voters approved two bond issues that will build and renovate schools, libraries, and a high school stadium for sports and other events. Schools will be built on city property, libraries will co-locate with schools, and all of these facilities will improve our neighborhoods. We'll create local gathering places and strong reasons to invest in a home and in businesses. We gained all of these results even while local property tax rates were going down. The plan builds facilities, supports good paying jobs, and is a smarter way to invest some $700 million in public bond funds. This is the plan that highlights our hopefulness for the future. Let's take a look. What we're doing is utilizing taxpayer dollars in a way that Spokane hasn't seen before and co-locating schools and libraries together to create a better product uh, for the entire community. One of our most exciting partnerships is in the northeast part of our community at Shaw Middle School, where we'll actually be building the new middle school as part of a larger campus with the public library right in the heart of it. We're real excited about what's going to happen around Shaw, where staff can access the public library for resources for educational purposes, but also students have a safe place to go before and after school and can get their studies done. And we'll be building a new facility for the East Central community uh, over at Liberty Park, uh, which is a partnership with the Parks Department. It is a partnership that will build a new library facility right here on these existing tennis courts that will continue the momentum of the East Central neighborhood. And this way we're able to really get the best bang for our buck for the entire community and have wonderful resources. So the school library partnership is a really an amazing uh, example of uh, government getting together and creating something bigger for the community. Andrew, Shelley, and Garrett have joined us this morning, and thank you for leading these efforts to all three of you. <laughs> While new schools and libraries will create new co community collaboration locations, our neighborhoods need other assistance, too. In neighborhoods across the city, we're working to increase housing choices and availability, another initiative guided by our strategic plan. As you know, our vacancy rate is very low, and we also don't have enough diversity in our housing mix. Retiring boomers and young millennials alike are looking for things like condos and townhouses, in addition to apartments and single-family homes. We've been working on infill regulations to incentivize the construction of these different choices in a more affordable way. My thanks to the staff for their hard work and to the City Council and the Plan Commission for passing these changes after considerable public input in the process. Housing priorities also include people who are experiencing homelessness. In our community and all throughout the county, helping provide resources for all of our citizens has certainly been a priority in recent months. After piloting a 24-7 shelter for single men and women, we ultimately ended up with too many people in a small area, causing secondary impacts to surrounding businesses and residents, along with safety and health concerns for those who were work that we were working to, uh, working to serve. Our strategic plan stretches us to try new things, but it also enables us to adapt when an initial approach doesn't work the way that we had intended. This year, we're moving forward with a revised approach that will include an addition of a second permanent shelter at a different location. We have increased funding for homelessness support by some $800,000 for 2019, bringing the city's total investment in these services to about $9.3 million a year. We must hold ourselves accountable to measurable outcomes when we invest such a significant amount of money. The revised approach will increase case management to help those experiencing homelessness get into permanent supportive housing while continuing to allow for shelter support. The goal is to deliver better outcomes for those experiencing homelessness and the community overall. 
It's not surprising that results are better for people when they're developing trusting relationship with the service providers that they connect with. These ties into the develop this ties into the development of our new Envision Center, one of only 17 in the country. This center on East 2nd Avenue will connect individuals with immediate services and allow them to apply for benefits, seek out employment opportunities, and more, all in a single location. We've already started training at the center among all the providers that will co-locate there, and we'll be ready to start taking customers and walk-ins in March. The center will help people navigate the complex system of services, giving them reasons to be more optimistic as well. This is about people programs, and partnerships. The approach is people-focused, using integrated programs run by dedicated providers and partners. Those programs also fit together with others, like HopeWorks that provides day job opportunities, hotspotters that will work with people who cycle through our emergency rooms and other public services, and Spokane Cares that connect citizens with social service programs. The path to self-sufficiency can be very difficult, but we do have examples of how those human connections provide one of the most effective tools when it comes to reaching out to those who need resources most. Through that outreach, we can achieve the positive, optimistic results we're all looking for. Rex was homeless for about 21 months, but thanks to our community partner at Union Gospel Mission, Rex is now a City of Spokane employee. Let's hear about Rex's story. This is one of the places I used to come to sleep. It uh, offered a little protection and a little shelter. I'd gone to the UGM and started uh, the program there uh, to get clean and sober. They help a, lo a lot once you're through the program to reintegrating you into a work workplace. The city took me on. I was one of the first people that, that started with the city. The UGM's real good about partnering you up with a past work experience. Rex has been a great addition to the water department. He has very strong work ethics and he impresses me each and every day. And now to watch him go out and be able to do good things in community where he's blessing other people, where he's a servant in the community doing good things, that's what we're all about. It took a lot of work, a lot of help from a, a lot of really good people. Yeah, it, it feels wonderful to be back, uh, back being a contributing member of society. Rex, thank you very much for being part of the Spokane family. Rex's hiring is about more than just celebration and of his success. It also fits into our strategic plan and the direction out of that plan to develop a 21st century workforce at the city government that's more representative of the city population. We want to expand diversity of our workforce in new ways. We were one of the first major employers in Spokane area to ban the box. We have hiring preferences for veterans, and last month we launched our supportive employment program at the city government. This program is designed to create job opportunities for eligible individuals with disabilities by effectively removing barriers that can prevent qualified individuals from gaining full-time city employment. This effort was informed in part by a 2016 report on gender and racial equity that the City Council Task Force put together. We want to provide opportunities for meaningful work for citizens throughout our community. We have many vulnerable citizens, and improving our support of those citizens is a key component of our strategic plan. We often interact with them through our police and our fire departments. Our behavioral health or response unit in the fire department is a very successful in diverting patients from emergency rooms to more appropriate, less acute care. Since June of 2018, this unit has successfully diverted nearly 50% of the patients it's contacted with from the hospital emergency rooms and connected them with behavioral treatment resources. This in turn reduces the demand on the fire department resources that are then available to respond to more acute emergencies. This builds capacity in our systems, just like our CARES program, which connects frequent 911 callers with appropriate social services and Ride to Care that helps people get to urgent care centers and planned medical appointments. 
Overall, our city fire department is improving medical outcomes. In particular, we're seeing higher survival rates and better outcomes for patients experiencing cardiac arrest or stroke. We are healthier as a result. On the safety side, with the addition of 10 new officers as a part of our 2019 budget, we'll have more police officers than ever before in city history. Since 2012, we've added some 52 officers to the Spokane Police Department. 17 of those officers were added to complete the recommendations identified in the collaborative reform pro process undertaken by the SPD. In 2018, we completed those collaborative reform efforts and reported out on the changes we have made to enhance community engagement, build relationships with diverse communities, reduce use of force, and interact with people in crisis. We also are working to improve the effectiveness of our officers' proactive policing time to gain better results. For our citizens, property crime remains a major concern. So addressing it is a key tenet of our strategic plan. We have been actively engaging our community on ways they can help to avoid becoming a victim of property crime, giving away auto theft prevention devices to owners of often stolen cars, and providing tips for residents and business owners. Knowing the serial numbers of your property also makes a huge difference. We're very excited about the progress we have continued to make on property crime. Property crime is down. Our new numbers show that while commercial burglaries have remained static, residential burglaries are down 11% over last year and vehicle thefts are down 7%. Nationwide, though, vehicle thefts are on the highest levels in eight years. So we're trending positively compared to the nation. Our vehicle theft task team is innovative, but we'd like to achieve even more as we work to create a more livable and safe community. Our officers could use more tools to assist them in their work. That's why the council and I are focused on a legislative change that would provide supervision for vehicle theft offenders. We need your help, though, on reaching out to our state partners to provide these resources, and here's why. Washington State is the only state in the country that does not have property crime supervision. It's a 10-year-old problem that makes Spokane's police chief want to bang his head on the steering wheel. The altered key and you get some type of a uh, hot wired ignition system looks like. In 2008, state budget cuts eliminated probation for convicted thieves and helped to drive crimes like auto theft out of control. A number of repeat offenders that we are experiencing that are committing property crimes is absolutely crushing this community with the amount of crimes that they are committing. And that's why the mayor and city council are asking the state legislature to fund a pilot program, one that would place habitual car thieves like Nick Davis under community supervision the next time he's released from prison. The lack of supervision for these offenders when they are released is, uh, if not encouraging them, it's allowing them to go back to the lifestyle that they've had. And that drug-addicted, no-rules lifestyle is hurting the rest of us. When someone comes out in the morning, their, their vehicle is gone. They can't go to work. They can't take their kids to school. East on Garland. When we get behind a stolen vehicle, these people have no incentive to stop. So now police are hoping they can at least slow down the number of cars getting swiped. One last time. What's your name? By bird dogging convicted habitual car thieves as soon as they're out of custody. What property crime supervision does is that provides a level of accountability to get out of the drug world, to stay away from friends that are a bad influence, as well as an incentive for them to get their life back on track. Community supervision for convicted car thieves will require more funding from the state legislature, but the police chief thinks we need new ways of putting the brakes on Spokane's car theft problem. Well, thank you to Chief Meidel for your testimony yesterday in the state Senate and also for this year, Senator Andy Billig, for sponsoring this legislation. Investments in public safety is our top priority. A safe commu community, though, also requires investments in our streets and other infrastructure. Our street investment for 2019 totals about $50 million, including everything from major capital reconstruction projects to basic maintenance work like grind and overlay, chip seal and crack sealing on both our arterials and our residential streets. This basic maintenance is all about what we call keeping the good roads good. 
properly timed maintenance on streets that have already been re reconstructed will enable them to last for decades, a key strategy of the 2014 street levy that will continue to fund these projects for another 15 years. This year, we'll see a major work on Five Mile, on Raythor, along the new phase of a work on East Sprague Avenue near the south landing of the University District Gateway Bridge. We'll work on I-90 Gateway at the Maple Street exit, a new greenway on Cincinnati in the Logan neighborhood, and the South Gorge, Tra Gorge Trail on Clark Avenue in Peaceful Valley. Those street projects have done more than just smooth out your drive and improve pedestrian safety. New streets, sidewalks, and streetscape amenities are good for Spokane's businesses. Along a revamped section of Sprague Avenue, Dale Kleist, the former owner of Fast Eddie's and Famous Ed's, has launched his latest venture. In an old storefront where people once had their fortunes told, Dale is now making some of his own predictions. Let's see what he has to say. The Union Tavern is probably for, uh, it'll be a destination uh, place for a while, and then I hope the neighborhood, you know, matures and it ends up being a neighborhood bar. Well, it's a lot of hard work, um, and we're pretty proud of what we came up with, you know. Um, but it's, it's hard work, but it's exciting. To be the, uh, the palm reading, and, and uh, it was board, the front was boarded up, pretty much just a shell on the front half, and then we added on a thousand square feet in the back. So the menu that we brought here is kind of the highlights from the other two places. But we have these dip sandwiches that have a special sauce. You know, we have salads um, and then, you know, good appetizers and, you know, a lot of the stuff you see at other places, but hopefully we do it better. I chose Sprague Avenue for the reasons, the affordability and the, you know, the, the street project that cleaned everything up and the way the neighborhood is coming around. Um, I think in the near future, it'll be, It'll be the place to be. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, and, and I hope the momentum keeps building. I mean, it's there's a lot of energy uh, with the, the businesses that are here, and uh, no, I think over time this will be it'll it'll pick up and it'll be the place people will know where to go. Our thanks to Dale who made this investment, but he wasn't able to join us today. In the East Sprague area, now dubbed Sprague Union District, public investment has led to increased property value, higher values for commercial real estate, and considerable new private investment. We've also seen a, reduce in, a reduction in crime due to the new lighting and increased pe uh, pedestrian traffic. These kinds of results aren't just limited to Sprague. On Monroe Street, between Indiana and Garland, we're seeing a transformation. Of course, we rehabilitated this section of Monroe this summer completing the project more than six weeks early. Again, yeah, there we go. Again, when we work from our thoughtful strategic plan, we innovate and promote smarter approaches. On Monroe, we included an intensive effort to support businesses during construction. We offered business coaching through the WSU Small Business Development Center, an operating loan program through Craft3, and a very popular facade improvement program that matched 200,000 city dollars with $600,000 in from the private sector for improvements on the corridor. We also supported a popular and effective marketing campaign developed by Rogue Heart Media called Meet on Monroe. Street construction is just part of our infrastructure investment this year. A major component of public investment over the last half dozen years has been our program to improve the health of the Spokane River. Getting to a cleaner river faster was one of the underlying collaborative projects that led to the joint strategic plan. And delivering that work affordably is key. We're finishing the last of the projects to reduce overflows from the combined wastewater and stormwater sewers this year. In all, we have 24 underground storage tanks with a total capacity of 16 million gallons. During large storms or period of rapid snow melt, our combined sewer system can become overwhelmed, leading to overflows of wastewater into the river. The new tanks hold that excess water until the storm surge has subsided and the wastewater can be sent to the treatment plant. Already, we've kept millions of gallons of combined wastewater from entering our river. The last projects are found, yeah, there we go.
The last projects are found along Riverside and East Spokane on First and Adams in West Downtown, and of course on Spokane Falls Boulevard by the Spokane or the Downtown Spokane Library. With each of these projects, we've worked to deliver above-ground benefits when we construct underground infrastructure. On Spokane Falls Boulevard, we'll see the most dramatic example of providing that value to our citizens. We'll effectively extend Riverfront Spokane all the way to Monroe Street with incredible vistas of the river that have not been celebrated in decades. Once again, we are creating connections to the river that will ensure its protection for our kids and our grandkids. Just like Riverfront Spokane, where we're putting a new focus on the river as part of the major renovation of our community living room. We're opening up views previously blocked. Seating and picture windows now face the river at places like the new carousel building. Some 134,000 people have ridden and looked out that window since it was opened in last May. Most importantly, though, this work is delivering a cleaner, healthier Spokane River for generations to come. Just ask people who spend most of their time on the river. Uh, it's extremely rare to have a trout fishery running through an urban city like Spokane. It's just super peaceful. You can come down and cast and just forget about everything. We got a lot of great whitewater opportunity in the beginning parts of the year. The Spokane River is one of the best places to raft here in the area. That's something not a lot of other cities have and something that we need to kind of appreciate more. Without clean cold water, we have no fish, we have no fishery, and really that, that hurts everything from the fish to the local economy. We rely on having a swimmable river that we can recreate and provide these tour zones. And this is something I want to be doing for the next 30, 40 years, pass it on to my kids and hope they can run with it from theirs. Having the Spokane River is an incredible resource for everyone, and it's an amazing asset to Spokane, and I hope we continue to protect the Spokane River. I love seeing that uh, the city and everyone's getting behind preserving the, the water quality and the fish, and uh, hopefully that continues. I'd love to see future generations fish this river and enjoy it like we do. Well, thanks to Josh from Wiley Waters and Sean from Silver Bow Fly Fishing. Protecting our water quality is just part of our work around sustainability. We're undertaking a large effort to increase water conservation. This year, the city challenged its citizens to consider implementing a new approach to their landscaping to save water, time, and money. The water efficient approach is called Spokanescape and includes the replacement of lawn with drought tolerant plant material and mulch that uses low volume irrigation. The city offered a utility bill credit of up to $500 to water customers willing to implement those changes. The response was great. Hundreds of people attended education sessions, dozens applied for the credits, and 22 projects have been completed. We're also updating the irrigation at our golf courses, Manitou Park, and other big water users. On the city golf courses alone, we believe that the irrigation upgrades and related improvements will allow us to maintain all four cor courses using about 75% of the water we use today. This work has required collaboration between our utilities and our parks department, another collaboration based in our strategic plan. We've mentioned it before, but it's worth saying it again. The city's renewable energy generation surpasses its use of electricity, natural gas, and fuel combined. Truly a greener city. That particularly impressive when you consider that our large fleet of vehicles include fire trucks, police cars, snow plows, and garbage trucks. The city's energy production includes hydropower at the upriver dam and electricity from the steam at the waste energy facility and the wastewater treatment plant. Earlier this year, Spokane and Urbanova, the community smart city initiative, received a national award for its work on a sustainable infrastructure solutions, including projects that save energy by dimming street lighting when traffic volumes are low, and also a shared energy project that works to improve system efficiency and grid resiliency. Spokane was one of only 16 cities recognized by the global research and intelligence firm IDC as a part of the awards program in New York City. 
It's also in the September-October edition of the magazine City Vision, the Association of Washington Cities featured the Spokane's sustainability, waste reduction, and disposal efforts in a feature story called Green Machine. We also are evaluating how to market the excess steam created by the waste energy facility in a way that would support a circular economy approach in that location. A circular economy considers ways to take the resources we have and use them to their fullest, even taking things once considered waste products and turning them into something valuable again. Our strategic plan supports the future of green jobs in our city, and those new jobs very well could grow out of traditional Spokane area industries like agriculture. That's what a company called Ag Energy is doing. They make a soil supplement made from wheat stubble. By repurposing the straw that once littered farmers' fields, Ag Energy is hitched a ride on our growing circular economy. Everything that we do as a city needs to be both financially and environmentally responsible. And what that means in terms of the circular economy is that we just don't waste anything. We need to get value out of every single resource that we have, and that translates itself into economic development as well. An example of um, the circular economy right here in Spokane is Ag Energy. Ag Energy has found a way to create energy and biochar out of wheat stubble. With the increased in, uh, awareness of environmental impacts of burning ag waste, we've created a system that we can uh, process it at a high temperature and a low oxygen environment. It burns very cleanly and it produces a biochar and uh, synthetic gas. So by taking that, producing that biochar and putting it back into the farmlands, we get increased yield, reduced water, and provide value back to the farmer. It's extremely exciting. It's, it's, we need to be doing more of this as a city. And again, Spokane has the opportunity to lead with concrete examples of sustainable business. That one person's trash is another person's treasure. Thank you, Katie and David, for leading this effort. The idea of a circular economy also is being explored as a part of the West Plains Public Development Authority. In another great partnership, an indication of our optimism for growth, the PDA is a joint program of the Spokane County, the Spokane International Airport, and the City of Spokane. The West Plains PDA is a place where companies can develop and market new uses for renewable resources, putting them to work in our community over and over again. It's also where, the Am where Amazon is building its new fulfillment center. The West Plains is just one of our targeted investment areas earmarked for growth. We've also put emphasis on the Northeast PDA in the Hilliard area, and of course, in the University District. In the Northeast PDA, community members are working on the development of the yard, which encompasses about 500 acres in industrial property. Larry Stone's new Esmeralda Commerce Park is also taking shape in this location, where the city and the county are working together on growth opportunities. Meanwhile, the opening of the University District Gateway Bridge is amazing. We definitely have created a new iconic structure that will facilitate growth and development to the south side of the railroad viaduct in this area. We have already are excited about the development of the Avistas Catalyst and Hub buildings, and we're pleased to be part of the announcement of the new Gleason Neurosciences Institute at WSU. We're working on a new development and growth plan for this part of the University District, and there is a lot of potential. Spokane's economic development strategy of targeted areas, targeted industries, and targeted investments is starting to bear fruit. Our marketing campaign West, uh, aimed at West Side companies and Spokane alumni who want to come back to their hometown is called Hacking Washington. For those non-millennials in the room, we're talking about what it is to have a life hack an approach for accomplishing something more easily. That means we're highlighting our convenient outdoor amenities, our more affordable housing, our shorter commute times, and our accessibility to the urban experience. These are the hacks that make it easier to choose Spokane. They are also reasons that everyone should be optimistic about our future. Our thanks to our higher education institutions for their assistance in communicating with their Spokane alumni. With this approach, we're luring new businesses to our area and creating new startups. Because Spokane is a smart city, 
we are attracting smart companies. A new software firm called Cloud Engage recently moved its headquarters from Portland to the 15th floor of the Paulson building. Cloud Engage is determined to maximize its return for its investors and choose Spokane to make those startup dollars go farther. So what Cloud Engage does with a very simple install is allows your website to look more like the web visitor. And every subsequent visit from that visitor continues to refine the experience. So that helps uh, those with websites increase their conversion rates. So what we do is anonymously uh, identify where the visitor is, what's happening in the weather around them, what they've done on your site in the past, uh, what brought them to the site in the first place, and a number of other variables. And what happens is in real time, we're able then to look at all of those factors and deliver an optimized web experience. The Spokane area, in our opinion, is perfect for startups right now. You know, you also look outside, you have this beautiful scenic area and a lot of really terrific things that you can do beyond work. And that's, I think that's really important when recruiting. Uh, I was spending 45 minutes each way to get to and from work, and I live nine miles from downtown Portland. We really have sort of a panoramic view of all of the amazing places we're able to recruit from, including the seven colleges and universities right outside our window. For office space as well, it's a, it's a relative bargain here in Spokane. And there was no better place when we looked at the analysis than Spokane. To just, uh, Spokane is a terrific place to do business as a startup. Here's Paul Wagner. Thanks for bringing Cloud Engage to Spokane. <laughs> Cloud Engage represents the next generation, and they are optimistic. So it comes full circle, back to the people who make our community great. I've been talking to Dr. Bob Lutz recently. He's the medical director from the Spokane Regional Medical Health District, excuse me, Spokane Regional Health District, about this concept called social capital. Dr. Lutz says that communities with high social capital score health, excuse me, social capital scores have healthier people. And it's one of our strategic plan measures. Social capital is a measure of how much we're interconnected as humans in our community. We look at things like whether we know our neighbors or whether we call them for help. We look at citizen engagement in public debates and discussions. We look at participation in our community activities like volunteer opportunities and book clubs and recreational classes. As a community, it appears we get high marks, especially when we get rid of the obstacles. Born out of optimism for our kids, when we opened up our pools for sweet, free swim, our citizens got out of their neighborhoods. Overall, attendance at our pools grew by a whopping 61%. Witter and Liberty Pools saw the biggest increases, more than doubling their summer attendance. At the library, people aren't just checking out materials anymore. They're getting together for a variety of programming, including the very popular Lilac City Live. In 2018, program attendance totaled some 87,000 people, up 35% over 2017. During Spokane Gives Month in 2018, for example, more than 20,500 volunteers provided 123,000 hours of service to 108 organizations for a $3 million volunteer impact. That all happened in just one month, remember? And really, it really speaks to our passion, our compassion, and our optimism of this community. The list could go on. Our mission is to have a lasting impact. In the end, we're making investments in infrastructure, parks, our river, downtown, business corridors, schools, and neighborhoods that will last for generations. Together, we are growing. Together, we are lifting up families. Together, we are creating this incredible city where people want to live, work, and play. A city that is smarter, safer, and healthier. Helen Keller once said that optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Our attitude and drive, our optimism, will be what moves us ahead. To be sure, it takes hard work. The hard work of creating a roadmap to the future found in our joint strategic plan. Through much of today's address, this graphic has been up behind me. This is a visual depiction of the plan, and I encourage you to go to SpokaneCity.org to get more information. Following that roadmap also requires hard work. We have some 2,000 city employees who are implementing the plan and delivering the services we all rely on. 
the employees were instrumental in crafting this plan. I do thank our employees, for without them, we could not succeed. We can see several of them here today in the room and so many more throughout the city taking care of business. And finally, we face the hard work to continuing following that roadmap, even during times of change. Thank you for taking this journey with me today and over the last seven years. I am excited about our future and for all what is next for Spokane, the true city of choice that is safer, smarter, and healthier. Thank you.